we're watching Growing Big, so obviously we're into food plots. And we realize that food plots, they, they oftentimes are the foundation upon which we build our hunting and management efforts from. The myth, though, is that they don't have to cost us a fortune. What we're going to talk about today is a whole bunch of ways to put in food plots and a whole bunch of ways that we can accessorize those food plots without it breaking the bank for us. We talk a ton about creating high odds, low impact setups. To be most effective, you have to match your improvements to the habitat. Western habitat, heck of a lot different than Midwestern habitat. He's not putting all that energy into building up his antlers until his body's taken care of. The overwhelming majority of the tips that I come up with are issues I'm running into while I'm out here working. I'm about to let you all in on a dirty little secret. And that is, as much as I would love to pretend that I go ahead and script all these shows, lay everything out, have professional camera guys out here filming me, all that stuff, none of that's the case. Actually, the reality is, what I do is the overwhelming majority of these tips are filmed while I'm actually out working on clients' properties that I manage for them. Never before has that been more true than today. Today, and what I do is I just make up the tips as I go along. Hmm, what are the issues I'm running into? If I'm running into them, guess what? Other people are as well. So today, what we're going to talk about is what to plant. Right back that way is the back finger of a field. Behind me is a glorious wooded ridge and frankly, the camera is darn near set up in a mineral lick. We're in a state where minerals are perfectly legal. And I'm back here refreshing this lick. The question I'm trying to ponder is, I know Mr. Big is bedded back on the end of that point, right there. Okay, I know that he has choices. He can head that way, he can head that way, or he can head that way to feed, or he can go this way. I want him to go this way. So, what should I I plant. There is no one single magic bean. Now, um, quite honestly, the, the planting I go for more often than not is Antler King Trophy Clover because, because it feeds deer for so darn long and you just get such volumes of food. So, hmm, that's a great choice. Yeah, it is, but if you really want to do the max good, with your food plots, offer a smorgasbord. I will be offering trophy clover. I will be offering honey hole. I will be offering um, some soybeans as well. And then I'm going to go ahead and top seed, top seed both the soybeans and that honey hole with three parts fall, winter, spring, a cereal rye, and one part lights out oats. So by doing that now, we have grain. We have clo We have a couple greens, actually. Um, we have clover. We have brassica. We have cereal rye, which is going to go dormant over winter. But every time there's a, there's a thaw, now it's going to spring back to life offering 15% protein. First thing in the spring, when everything else is dead and brown, that cereal rye will be green and offering 15 plus percent protein. That's huge. That is huge because as much as we talk about over winter, that period between snow melt and spring green up, that's when that's a tipping point for a lot of deer. If we can offer greens one, two, three weeks sooner than nature does it, hey, triple bonus points. So you add all of that together and now we have a whole bunch of different draws because all food sources, every single food source out there has growth stages where it is most desirable and growth stages when it's least desirable. At the same time, the whitetail biology and physiology is changing throughout the course of the year. 
You know, because of that, their nutritional needs change. So what we're going to do is we are going to plant a whole bunch of things that goes ahead and offers a smorgasbord that addresses all phases of season and year-round nutrition. Soybeans, great, great summer draw. Same with the clover. Now, those oats and the clover and some of the strains of brassicas in a honey hole are all good early season draws. Then we have the soybeans kicking back on once they dry out. We have the we have the cereal rags starting to really get going and getting a great draw. We still have the oats and we have the brassicas for mid-season. Late season we have cereal rye, we have brassicas, we've got grain, we've got the entire pitcher covered. And that is the best possible seed you can plant. Not one, a smorgasbord that addresses it all. Many people are always searching for that magic bean, that one food plot seed that I put this in the ground and it changes everything. There isn't that one seed. Instead, offer a smorgasbord. Offer a smorgasbord that addresses their nutritional wants and needs early season, mid season, late season, and then if you really want to do some good, over winter and into spring. Do that and you create a powerful season long draw. Grown Big TV is brought to you by 10 Point Crossbow Technologies. There is no substitute. Redneck Blinds the best hunting blinds on the planet. Ferminator, the best food plot implement on earth. Hunter safety systems, saving lives is what we do. And by Antler King, bigger bucks, healthier deer. This segment of Grown Big TV is brought to you by 10 Point Crossbow Technologies. There is no substitute. Talk to a group of hunters on what you should plant for food plots, and you know what? You're going to get a whole bunch of wide-ranging answers. We're going to answer that when we come back. Visit sportsmansguide.com today and see why they're the place to go to get where you want to be outdoors. Find the very best deals on the latest gear for hunting, shooting, camping, and everything else under the stars to fuel your passion. Shop sportsmansguide.com. We all get excited when we produce a thriving food plot. Good reason. We put blood, sweat, and tears into that work. We prayed for rain and man it came up and it is thriving. Keep one thing in mind though, we are not cash cropping. When it comes to food plots, what we're trying to do is we are trying to grow food for deer. Okay, That is very, very different than trying to make a living farming. Okay, Weeds, Weeds aren't necessarily a bad thing, especially broadleaves, so long as they are not taking over our plots. They're our friends, they're deer food, okay? We can even use those broadleaves to our advantage when we're trying to establish crops you know, that are in food plots that are just too small, that are going to get too much browse pressure. Those weeds help take a little browse pressure off the plots. Now, first the deer are going to eat the weeds. As I said, weeds, broad leaves, a good majority of them, frankly, are deer food. So those weeds take some feeding pressure off of our candy crops. And that can be an issue. When we're dealing with small plots, high deer numbers, what ends up happening is the deer overbrowse the plots. As they overbrowse the plots, they wipe it out. Now, now once the broad leaf competition gets to be too high, Oftentimes there are various herbicides we can use, but more often than not, we don't even have to do that. You know, just go in there and mow it high. Lap off those broad leaves. Give our food plot a chance to go ahead and come back up in and fill in. The other thing we can do is mix in a foliar fertilizer if we're going to go ahead and go the chemical route. Okay, that way what ends up happening is the chemicals are absorbed by the bad plants you know, along with the fertilizer. That goes ahead and really gives those noxious weeds a growth spurt. Okay, we want that because on foliar fertilizers and foliar 
herbicides, you, know, you have to have contact with the living plant. That living plant sucks in those chemicals and that's what kills them. Okay, so by also having the fertilizer in there, it's, it's like, man, I gotta get growing here, I gotta get growing. So they suck in more of the chemical that kills them. At the same time, our food plot, we're using a herbicide for example, on clover, we're spraying a grass killer. So that grass killer is not harming our clover. Okay. But the fertilizer is giving it a growth spurt. So always remember, we are not cash cropping out here. We are farming for deer. All we're trying to do is produce deer food. Broadleaves can be our friends in those regards. You know, they are not our bitter enemy. And we can go ahead and top seed things such as fall, winter, spring, a cereal rye, lights out oats, obviously an oat. Trophy clover is great for frost seeding into crops. You now, honey hole is a really easy brassica planting that's going to go ahead and produce decent growth simply by throwing it on top of the dirt. You do those things, you're going to stack the odds of producing deer food, even if they don't look like those pictures of the food plots look like they belong on a cover of a magazine. That's great for writers like me, but it's unimportant for deer hunting. Deer hunting, all that matters is we got food there that the deer want. Now that we've got a thriving food plot, man, we are all sorts of excited, but just remember, we're not done. There are all sorts of ways we can take our game up yet another notch by accessorizing that food plot, and that's what we'll be talking about next. You know what? We're all excited. We just got a new food plot in. Man, I can't wait for, for hunting season to start. Got the stand up. I'm ready to hunt. Are you really? You can go ahead and take what you just did there and you can jack it up several notches. Go ahead and accessorize your food plot. All sorts of things you can do. 20 yards out in front of that stand, go ahead and dig a hole about two and a half to three feet deep and plant yourself a scrape tree to point back at the stand. Is that gonna make it so every single deer that comes out in that food plot goes to that location? No, but you just go ahead and increase it 5%. You get 5% more of your bucks to come over there and it happens to be one of them that you want to kill, you know what? You're happy. Okay. Next, edge feather that plot. Just go ahead and hinge cut the low timber value trees, about this big and smaller, out around the edge of that plot, five yard band. You hinge cut it, what you're doing is you're cutting through the back side of the tree, the tree falls over, you got that connection to the root system. The more connective tissue, the greater the odds are that that tree is going to continue to live. Now, that canopy is down right there at mouth level to those deer. They've got all that extra browse and you just opened up the forest floor. That's going to get more sunlight and that's going to kick up more growth as well. Three, four years from now when that gets nice and thick, hmm, about 20 yards down from the stand site there, you might want to cut yourself a nice little trail about 32 inches going through it. Guess what? Deer are going to start using that a lot more than anywhere else. Is every deer going to use it? No. But that buck uses it that you want to kill on the day you're up in that stand. That's all that matters. Okay. Next, if you're in a northern state, add a water hole. You don't need to go out and get yourself a dozer to dig a water hole. Just get yourself about a 20 gallon bucket. Bury it to the lip. Pack the dirt in really good. Put a stick in that thing so that the rodents that crawl into it can get out. And you know what? You put that about 20 yards away from your stand in a safe wind direction, blockade off this backside so they have to come in like this to drink. You got another shot angle. You can take it even another step further. Go ahead and plant half dozen apple trees out there. Put two early season varieties, two mid season varieties, two late season varieties. Now you have fruit. Okay, so now you have edge feathering. You've got licking branches all over around that food plot that you created. You've got that scrape tree planted out in there. You know what, let's even go further. Rather than just planting that whole one acre plot in brassicas, let's ring that outer, oh, five, 10 yard swat with antler king trophy clover. Because you know what? The brassicas, the soybeans, they're not gonna grow that well right up next to the woods. You get all that shade, You've got those trees robbing the soil nutrients. Okay. Clover does pretty well there though. 
So now we've got that little buffer. We've got clover and then in the center we're going to put honey hole or we'll go ahead and put a soybean or or maybe even if we're really ridiculous we'll plant corn but by having that buffer there we're getting more food production out of that plot now let's even take another step further now once those brassicas get up about yay high when that corn starts to turn when those soybeans start to turn go ahead and take cereal rye fall winter spring Mix it with three parts fall, winter, spring, or cereal rye, one part lights out oats or regular oats, mix that up and go out there and just top seed it. Hand seed it right over top. So now we've got clover. We've got brassica or green. We have cereal rye. We have oats. We have the edge feathering. Not any one of them changes the world. Add them all together and you know what? You just might. Grown Big TV is brought to you by Chestnut Hill Outdoors. Reconics, see what you've been missing. And by Wildlife Research Center, the gold standard. Back again with my good friend Adrian from Ferminator, and we're going to talk food plots again today with the man, the myth, the expert himself. <laughs> um, all right, there are 8,000 different ways to put in a food plot. Let's talk a few little creative ways because a lot of people have it in their mind that, geez, if I'm going to go ahead and plant corn, I obviously need a drill and a corn planter. You know what? That guy who's food plotting five acres, the girl who's food plotting six, seven acres, it probably doesn't make a lot of sense to go out and buy a Great Plains drill. So how can we use, how can we use the equipment we have to end up planting crops such as corn, such as soybeans, cereal rye, oats, that type of stuff? Well, the, one of the key things, and you and I have talked about it before, is, is we're planting for wildlife. We're not row cropping. We're not trying to make money off of this. So you're not, you don't have to have uh, peak efficiency. The, the yield doesn't have to be as good as if you're trying to pay the mortgage on the farm. Um, so like a lot of times for corn, we'll incorporate corn in a blend with something else. We'll have a, a warm season blend that a lot of times we put in, if you have a clover plot or, or an existing plot, put strips of that in. Sure. Um, and you can do that with something as simple as just a disc arrow and a, and a bag spreader, if that's what you need to do, and then disc it in again. A lot of those large seeds do just fine, you know, disced in uh, um, after you plant. Um, and well, is, is there a way? Is there a way to go ahead with nothing more than a disc and a cultipacker to essentially create a poor man's no-till drill? Absolutely, How absolutely. How do that? Um, you'd probably want to work the soil first, make your first passes and work the soil completely. Then um, um, if you're planting a large seed, let's say you're planting soybeans. With soybeans, when you are uh, dropping the seed, you'd want to make sure you have if you're doing it, if you have a, a disc and a seeder in one, you want to have your speed up so that you're you're dropping those seeds in, but your discs are throwing dirt to help cover it up without disking it so deep that you're planting it two or three inches deep, just dropping a layer of, of dirt on top of it. And if they're not incorporated, then you would you know disc heavily your first time, broadcast it in there, and then lightly disc that second time and cultipack it in. And that cultipack is going to help that. Uh, sm that uh, small layer of soil that you put on top of help press that down, keep sure. the birds off of it, and well, and uh, <clears throat> when it comes to stuff like that, it's generally a good idea to essentially forget about planting rates too. Without a doubt. Yeah, I mean, I personally end up when I'm doing the, using these types of techniques, I go ahead and I put on 150 to 200 percent. That's what I do as well. Double it, rate. double it up. Okay. Now, and what you just described is great for great for substituting for a traditional planter. How about when you don't want to break the soil? But is there a way that we can cheat the system and, and create our own poor man's no-till drill? You can. Uh, you can uh, set your disc straight and use your three-point lift to adjust it to where it's just lightly uh, disc in that soil. It really helps if you go ahead and spray it beforehand so that you've killed whatever vegetation is in there so it, it cuts out the competition. But if you lightly disc and seed brassicas in or any of those small seeds, they will find their way into a lot of those 
very shallow slits that you've now put in it without turning over the, the soil, without digging up new rocks. If you're in rocky soil, my, my place at home is like that. A lot of times a, a light disc with the small seeds, you get a great food plot that's very attractive. And then, and then you go ahead and you, again, you're relying on the cult packer. I mean, I'll cut right through the baloney here. If you got a ferminator, you just go ahead and set the disc straight. Now, <clears throat> adjust the pressure points so that you don't have as much weight on the disc itself. You've got more weight on the cultipacker, so the cultipacker is sealing these holes Absolutely. as well. If you don't have a ferminator, you just have a regular disc, you set your gang straight, go through, cut it, then you'd go back over, seed it, and then you'd come over with a cultipacker, cultipack it, and boom, it's not going to be, please correct me if I'm wrong, it's not going to be as effective and as efficient as a real no-till drill but it's going to get you by absolutely and we're not row cropping we are we are just planting for wildlife typically if you're putting in the food plot it's because you don't have enough forage for them or you need to get them to, to that one spot you know to, to kill them but um you'll get your you'll get your good results beautiful thanks for making thank us you, all Steve. better plotters my friend thanks